Welcome back, guys. This is episode three of the Odyssey podcast. On the show today, we have Mr. Andrew Rowe. Andrew, say hello. Hey, guys. How are you? Very good. So <laughs> we're gonna just we're gonna have a, a general chat with Andrew. We've got some questions we want to ask him about his lifting and his coaching. Andrew is a multiple time international lifter. He's he's lifted where with under the the era singlet twice now. Twice, isn't it? Yeah. Twice. Um should be more, but COVID. Oh. Um <laughs> and uh multiple national record holder and also a fantastic coach. Anything uh anything to add on your your wonderful introduction, Andrew? Probably just most well renowned best Odyssey coach, but not much else. That's fair. You won't face much resistance I agree. on that. I agree. One. Yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. definitely. He's a great guy. <laughs> so tell us how's your we've talked about you on both shows we've done so far and you, you messaged me saying that you loved being talked about so much i do did, yeah did a lot for your ego so mm-hmm. we're gonna obviously it was obviously the natural progression to just get you on the show so, you talk about <laughs> so i can yourself. talk about myself exactly so yeah. hey us andrew we're gonna jump right in with one of our questions what is it like to wear the air singlet what are what are the differences between wearing you know just just competing normally at a normal competition and getting to actually wear that air singlet um it feels like there's a like a a pressure put on you just for wearing that singlet um regardless of who you are or what you're lifting um i guess you do have to get to that stage and you know it took it took training, it took effort to get to that stage. So I guess it's justified the pressure. Um, but it's awesome. It's really awesome. It's like a, it's like a tangible result of a load of work. Um, like it's more than just an experience. You actually have this, this item with you. It's one of the only instances in powerlifting where you have that, right? Because like, obviously our results are, are lifts and the improvements in, in lifts, but to get that air a singlet that's it you know it's almost like yeah. the highest honor yeah. one can uh one can get in the sport yeah that's really cool that's really cool you mentioned the pressure um the pressure of wearing the singlet how how do you find yourself handling that pressure is there anything is there any you know tactics you employ to handle it or do you just kind of blunt force your way through it i used to blow my blunt force my way through it uh to a degree um until in Sweden, um, I paused, blunt forced my way through it, and then nearly fell over on my first <laughs> squat um, for no reason. Like it was a weight I'd taken a thousand times. Um, it wasn't going to be tough, but it was still just nerves. Um, how do I deal with it now? I probably give a lot of credit to you. You kind of keep my head screwed on uh, with regards to pressure, uh, expectations, and so on. Um, and I guess just experience, becoming comfortable at competitions with competition prep um and then after prepping for nationals last year injured um where we were like look <laughs> we're lucky to even get to the competition like it doesn't matter what happens the more you start to think like that and the more you start to almost relieve the undue pressure on yourself it, it's it's easier when your expectations were kind of adjusted you found that that adjusted the the pressure that I don't, I don't want to say that you put on yourself but just the pressure in general that you felt that'd be right yeah yeah absolutely, absolutely do you think if you weren't injured or dealing with with pain going into it how would that pressure of coming into the national competition have compared with the international you know because I, I i wonder on a national level these are people who are directly your rivals and these are all this is everyone that you know whereas oh, yeah. in the world like if you obviously everyone's watching you and your everyone's eyes are on you but you can you have a bit of anonymity you know like yeah. you can just hide in the back of the, the yeah it doesn't matter if you mess up it doesn't matter if you go on the platform you know yeah um what do you think yeah like nationals is a whole different story i guess you're more comfortable at home uh you have the comfort of being at home knowing everyone knowing the as far as the judges, like, you know, the spotters, you know, I have Adam there, uh, all these home comforts, like my mom's there, you know, my mom's watching me. Um, whereas when you're out there, it's like, 
it's like damn I've come all this way now like I, I can't mess up now like <laughs> um yeah I don't know and then the injury I guess going into nationals had I not have been injured I would have been would have been expecting that of myself like I have to hit the national record I have to break the national record there's nothing stopping me whereas with the injury it was like oh well you know if I don't it's because I have one adductor you know but you're like, you're like fuck it I'll do what I can here you know, fuck it I'll do what I'm I can enough to be here you know it goes great and it almost it was almost the confidence boost I didn't know I needed because even with the injury you can you can still try and get around it and, and hit some PRs a follow on question from from that is you know you know when you're competing internationally that we're all watching but we're not there can you feel that like could you feel was it was it going through your mind walking out to that 227 opener that you nearly dumped in Sweden uh was it going through your mind like you know I probably got hundreds of people watching me right now that aren't necessarily right here in front of me yeah like to be honest when I nearly dumped that that opener um I was kind of just thinking of my direct circle, uh, myself, you, the people, and my mom, like the people that put the most amount of time into the prep. Um, I was really like, shit, am I really gonna, gonna mess this up for us? Like, um, but then in, on the, on the grander scale of, of everyone watching, um, it almost helps. It, it actually does help, uh, to know that you have all these people kind of rooting for you. Um, even though I wasn't in particularly at Worlds, uh it turned out it wasn't in contention for medals really i wasn't i wasn't close to the top two dudes um who were extremely strong um so it wasn't even to win it was just to do well just to do your best um but yeah and then at euros in lithuania uh in 2019 um as you guys know and for anyone watching who doesn't know we have a, a infamous odyssey group chat with everyone um in it and it's quite active so when i was there you know warming up and then i took like my first squat attempt or my bench attempt um, and i go onto my phone just to pass the time change the music and i'd have like the odyssey chat coming up like holy shit like he's crushing it oh my god you know yeah that really helped kind of it, it made me so it feels so comfortable like i was i was in a completely different country and everybody was at home just watching me chilling that's awesome that's mm. awesome are there any like tangible differences did you notice any tangible differences between international comp and domestic comps just in with regards to how they're run or the mm. vibe or anything like that see one thing that does stick out to me when you're away abroad is uh a lot of people are missing lifts but they're the best lifters in the world um, and that could be a combination of nerves and pressure pressure to win um but also I, like i was going to point out oh the 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 refereeing, the judging is, is super strict, but it, it's strict here as well. Um, so that's not really a difference, but it's quite noticeable because it's almost like the stakes feel higher, um, even though we're doing the exact same thing that we do at home. Um, you know, I guess, you know, one thing that actually is quite different is, is adjusting to having someone else handle you uh, other than you. Like I'd, I'd, I was so used to you um, that, it, you know, I had to, you have to build a relationship with the coaches um you know thankfully i got on or I, I at the time i was quite good friends with jay and then lithuania i was quite good friends with steven and uh it was nice to have them handling me but uh, that's an adjustment you definitely have to make and um, when you're used to having one hand or one person your coach who you have this relationship with you trust them whereas you have to put all this prep all this time into the hands of the person handling you um and then i guess another thing that was awesome was uh, when you're in the warm-up room, you have, you know, I had like the whole strength militia crew just loading for me. And I, I had one rack to myself warming up. In the warm-up room, this massive warm-up room, you have Spain over in the corner shouting their heads off and you have like France, super quiet, you know, to himself. And you have like all these different countries. Uh, and then you have like six people just like making sure you're okay, you know, loading the bar. Uh, no one even interrupted you. You just sit down, they pass your water, like, but it's not like, you know, these are just guys we know and, and you would do the same for them. Um, but it's awesome to have that. Whereas at home, we're all crowded into, you know, the corner of wherever we are, uh, sharing a rack with like 20 different guys. Izzy's rack height is like five notches above mine. And like, 
Adam has to do all the plate loading himself. So it's, it's, it can be a tedious process. Uh, that's a pretty tangible difference, whereas you feel like a, like a superstar when you're over there and everybody's just giving their time and effort to you. Yeah, for sure. Did you notice, like, the, the more, like, uh, while I was sitting there thinking about it, I suppose as, as the athlete who's literally just lifting when they're told to lift, you might not notice it, but d- did you notice the difference in, in the running time, in, in how kind of on time and how quick things were? Or were you just there for the ride and letting letting other people kind of do everything? It was, it was pretty smooth. What do you mean, like, in, like compared to at home? Yeah, like, I, I found at, at my, the international comp that I went to, everything was quicker, like much quicker. And you really had to be on the ball. There was no, like, you, you couldn't make a mistake. Especially because the stakes were so high, you couldn't um, you couldn't misuse your time whatsoever. You had to really be on it with uh, warm ups and and everything like that. You know, whereas at home you might have a little bit more wiggle room. Yeah, I guess actually that's something that I never even considered. Um, on my third attempt squat, I had taken two thirty five at Euros second attempt, and uh, you know, Stephen, I told Stephen, look, like if if we're in the running for a squat medal, just put it on. Um, but I wasn't that confident. Um, I'd be more confident now in just yellowing a squat. But back then, I was kind of like, so he wasn't too sure. And this is something that probably made the difference. Whereas if Adam, you were there, you probably would have just put it on. You you would know that I had it or it didn't have it. Um, but I think I needed to put on 247 to, to, to even chance getting a medal, which was like a fairly big jump and it would have been a huge PR. And uh, Stephen, was, Stephen first had to figure that out. And you have a minute to put your next attempt in. So he first had to figure out what it was that I would need. Then he had to come to me, figure out how to say this without alarming me, that it was probably out of my reach, and gauge my response to 247. But me playing it cool, I was like, 247. Hmm. Do you know, mm. we go 247? I almost wanted to just text you or something. And uh, Stephen, like, I can't blame him. He was like, mm, like, do, uh, do, do we put it on or... And I was like, uh, no, maybe not. And then, you know, the minute was starting to run out. And I think we opted for like 2.42 or something. And, uh, you know, it was too late. It was, it was too late. And uh, he went to he went to put it in. And they're like, no, you were too late. Uh, you know, you get the 2.5 jump. And I was like, shit. You know, that's kind of shitty. But, uh, and if we if we had been at home, I guarantee, uh, am I back? Yeah. Uh, if we had been at home, I have a feeling the people uh, doing the, the number input probably would have taken the, the attempt. Yeah. I definitely would have loaded 247, by the way. But I don't I don't blame Stephen whatsoever. Neither it's actually, I. it's funny you say that, you know, if we were at home, one example of that is um, there, there's a rule in the IPF rule book that states you can only break um, or you can only chip a record if that record is like relevant to the championships you've entered. So, for example, if you are competing in an open championships like nationals, you can't chip a junior record. Um, but we did that. <laughs> and well, I got I got permission. I literally asked the president of the federation, can I chip a junior record? And he goes, yeah, go for it. So <laughs> definitely at a at like, a, you know, international comp, that's not flying. Um, but yeah, that's that's one thing I found as well. Everything like. There's no no um, leeway whatsoever. You're not being forgiven for little mistakes. You know, you, ha- you really have to be on board with everything, especially timings. And I think definitely the coaches probably feel that more so than more than the athletes, because especially if yeah. you're handling multiple people, you know, and you've got these other these other nations around. And if like I saw the warm up room in Lithuania and it was bananas, like it was just insane. I think like you could you could run a IPF flight, two IPF flights, and still have lads training in the background. Yeah, yeah. Plenty to go around. Um, in Estonia, there was five racks, I think, five ER racks. So it wasn't, you know, that luxurious. And um, <laughs> it reminds me of when Team India, it was the first time I had ever seen a Team India at a, at a like world championships for, for, for anything in, in powerlifting. But um, first of all, this was the competition. I don't know if anyone saw this. This was the competition where they cheated. Did you guys? Do you guys remember this? Yeah, I remember you telling me. They. I remember sitting in the warm up room. I was sitting next to Steph Hewitt, and we saw this this girl warming up, and we were like, "Geez, her singlet's very tight." <laughs> like, 
it looks like it looked like she was wearing briefs, but like obviously you're there at an international IPF competition. That doesn't really, you know, enter your mind. You're not gonna think that she's cheating that blatantly by wearing squat briefs. Like, but it turned out this girl was wearing squat briefs, <laughs> and she went out and cheated. But it was, um, yeah, in the warm up room it was myself and Dav. I think we were handling, we were handling two two lifters. And um, so it was me and Dav, two lifters, two Irish lifters, and I think it was two French lifters on the on the one rack. And there was this big, massive Indian team. I think they had like eight lifters in the flight or something. So they just come and swarm us, literally swarm the rack. And like we're full, like we're already finding it hard to kind of keep everyone going and getting, you know, getting warm ups done on time. The rack is full. And uh, they swarm around and me and Dav just stand on either side of the bar, holding on to the bar. Like me and Dav say to each other, they're not getting in. So we're just standing there. They're literally trying to push in beside us to try and load their lifters attempt. But uh, not, not, on, not on the international stage. <laughs> if we were at home, me and Connor would have been like, oh, yeah, yeah grand, what you need? But uh, not there. That's a bad habit, especially yeah. at the, at the oh international my God. level. You can't be... The sound man in the warm up room. If you give them an inch, that will take so much. I think, I think it's something we pride ourselves on, specifically you and I, mm. or at least I do, being being the sound man in the warm up room. And it's Absolutely. left us in it's left us in the shit so many times, where <laughs> we've got our like three or four, sometimes more people to get ready, but we take on five or six other fellas, and we're just standing there, loading, unloading, loading, unloading. It especially seems to be the people who. God love them. Don't really know what's going on, and you'd be like, "What's your next warm up?" And you're like, "I don't know. What do you think? How did that move?" And it's like, "I don't know. I don't know you." <laughs> it's like, "Just fucking come on!" And then you're like, "Right, my lad has taken this, so you're gonna take this too." And they're like, "Sound man, thanks." You're like, all right. Yeah. The yeah. the scene on an international level seems maybe it's just you, Andy, but it seems that if this time and this closeness with other teams to to make such great friends with with lifters you would never even come into contact with or never even heard of like i know yourself yeah. and a few of the members of, of team france are really good friends what is it about that international setting or is it the proximity that you're warming up together or you're watching each other what is it about the i suppose the international level that allows you to to make such such good friends I suppose there's a few things. Um, you spend the, the months coming up or leading up to the competition kind of watching each other and not knowing each other and you're like, oh, I want to beat this dude. Like, you know, creating this artificial disliking for these people. Uh, and then you go and meet them and they're like, just like you, they just speak a different language. And it's like, oh, you know, this is me. Just, so it's just you know. I can see where I love them so much. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, and... Um, <laughs> It's just great. And I guess like another element is now not like you wouldn't be making friends with people outside of your age group, but at Worlds, of course, when you're a sub junior, you're competing with sub juniors. You're not just in the in the weight class like at home. Um, like if you were to go to an open competition here, an 83 kilo lifter is with everyone from kids competing to your granddad competing. Uh, there's no there's no division whereas over there uh you're all probably taking a break from school to come over here you know um or from the same year and like everybody's doing exams and i remember uh Kirill in worlds like he won he won the 93 kilo so junior class and uh i was like oh you're coming out to celebrate and everything well done and he's like oh, i have to go study for my a level uh, or whatever it's called their last their their kind of equivalent to leaving so um which just struck me. I was like, damn, like he's the same as me. You know, we're all in the same boat here. Um, I guess, I guess that makes a difference, you know? That's cool. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, how have you found transitioning from, you know, athlete only to a coaching role? How has that transition been? Was there much of a transition or do you kind of land on your feet? Um, I don't think there was much of a of a transition. Um, I had always, you know, I guess aspired could be the word to use uh, to to help people in the coaching role. 
Um, and I always trained my sister, Abigail. So um, there was always an element of taking what you guys were doing, or particularly you, Adam, uh, and applying it to, to someone else that I could help. Um, so transition to the coaching role, I'd say the, the biggest change was just more annoying for you because I, I could I had better rebuttals to your ideas and I was questioning things more because, as uh, you know, would I do that as, as a coach, you know? We um, talked about this last week. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, has, has coaching, I know you kind of just touched on it there, but has coaching kind of influenced your you know yourself as an athlete at all has it changed how you conduct yourself has it changed how you approach training what, what what's coaching done for your athletics i think uh your own training probably sees a lot of benefit um you don't put too much weight on things that don't matter that's probably one of the biggest things uh when you realize what you what you worry about or don't worry about or look for in someone else's training you start to realize what to look for in your own um, and then you just you start prioritizing the things that matter. That's easier said than done as well, though, isn't it? Like, I'm sure. Oh, I'm, absolutely. I'm, you uh, as well, probably. Like, if I just followed my own advice, I'd be in such a great spot here. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if, yeah, absolutely. If you're like, I know this next jump isn't going to be at my <laughs> prescribed RP, and then you're like, but I fucking want to do it anyway. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we know that even even with dealing with the with, with each other, like if I was to send uh, Adam a video and be like, yeah, so it's my last warm up thinking this, but I don't know if it's there. And Adam would probably read that as he's looking for me to say that it is there and he's just yes. going to fucking do it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's gas. That, that's sometimes all you need. Uh, find, you like, just need someone you know, to fucking say it. You need that. Like, it's obviously everybody knows how tough it is to be objective when you're looking for an RPE, particularly the heavier sets, uh, you know, something like a, a five and nine or, or less reps even. Um, it's tough, especially in like a, a PR kind of realm where you're approaching weights that you're, that you're literally scared of. Uh, it's tough. It's tough to look at that and think, oh, I'm definitely good to go. Up. So sometimes all you need is someone, whether it be your coach or just someone you trust to say, Jesus, no, definitely load whatever. It just, it just confirms for you. Um, Sometimes it even convinces you if you if you if you were thinking, oh no, I'm only going to take a two and a half kilo jump here. They're like, dude, that was easy. Five kilos, seven kilos, you know. Just somebody to. It it might not even be objectivity. It might you might know that, okay, it's probably going to be an overshoot, but I can I I can see what this mental block is to this person. So regardless of if it's mm. exactly the fucking RP, which is a silly thing to say because it's an approximation anyway, but yeah you know how important it is for them to get past this block this mental block i should say and you saying you have that work away is a big fucking deal and especially Absolutely. if they're you or fucking yeah. adam it's it's okay this guy knows his shit he knows how i lift he knows how i train and for him to say that this is good for you whether it is or not is special Absolutely. you know for sure i actually got a really cool text during the week from one of the lads that i coach um who listened to i think it was the first podcast we discussed you know just kind of sending it on weeks where you feel good like if you've no you know you've no competition inside or anything like that if, if you feel good you know going for it and uh he actually had surgery not so long ago only um a couple of months ago now i want to say and uh, this was his first block back and training was flying anyway i was really you know firstly glad to just see see him moving but um his training in in the last couple of weeks had just been absolutely flying so this last week he loaded a number that has been a barrier for him for a long time on a day he was feeling fantastic and just went for it now it was a couple rp over what the prescribed rp was but the value in you know, just absolutely destroying that mental barrier that was there, especially after, you know, having had surgery and having been, you know, laid off for a few weeks, like it was, it was class. And and the reason he did that is because he had listened to the, the first podcast nice. and he had heard us talking about it. So shout out, Darren, shout out, Darren. Nice one. It, as we said there, it can get a little bit, but Harry's like, yeah, I'm feeling really good. I feel like we could 
we could really send it today. It's like, well, this is the third time this week you've said that. So, <laughs> so calm down. <laughs> uh, fair fucks to him. Nice one. Absolutely. Andrew, tell us, we've talked a lot in, as I mentioned at the start of the podcast, we've talked a lot about your, your training over the last, last year. Why don't you give like us... Rehabbing. Yeah, I don't yeah. think we fully discussed the whole arc. We haven't given, you know, the full context. So why don't you give us the kind of full outline of what happened and uh, how we've overcome it and, and how training is going at the moment. Um, okay, so take us back to 2020. Uh, the year where it all went down, right? Hmm. Um, we were prepping for nationals and had just come off the back of Euros. Um, so I had just been prepping for that. And, you know, going into a competition, you're usually handling loads um, that are up around your one or max. Uh, then we went into prep for nationals and uh, I was getting stronger. I just moved up to the 93 kilos from the 83. Uh, my food was higher than ever before. Um, I felt less pressure because... I was going up a weight class. I was feeling stronger. I wasn't going abroad, uh, all these things. Um, and we had our eyes set on a squat record, a squat junior record, which was 253, 252.5 maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it was, it was going to be there and squat was, was rising very fast. Uh, but the whole time I was, I was getting this insane adductor pump and doms from squat sessions, from comp squat sessions. Um, a lot of things went into that, you know, what, like I was, I was getting heavier loads increasing very fast. I just widened my stance as well, which was a coincidence. Um, and all this. And then after my last squat session, I hit like 220 for five, 200 for seven, 180 for seven, like huge numbers, huge milestones. Uh, and the next day I couldn't squat to like parallel. Uh, and after that, my adductor was just not cooperating. So, um, you know, obviously there is the fear. Oh my God, I'm not doing nationals anymore. I can't move. Uh, I couldn't squat that weekend at all. Uh, and then the next week, I think I squatted 140. And then I had a, a deload week anyway. Um, I think I hit 180 for like a single pause. And then the next week, it was just getting better. I was seeing a physio, uh, my guy Ed, and uh, he was doing some manual therapy as Adam loves. And uh, funny enough, went in the next squat session, hit 230 for three or something um, with like no pain. Um, the adductor wasn't healed. It was still hurting me day to day. But uh, for some reason, it was, you know, pain's weird. And, the voodoo uh, magic of manual therapy. The, the voodoo <laughs> magic got us there to nationals and we hit the broken national record, which is awesome. 254, uh, probably my favorite squat session or my squat, favorite squat of my life. Um, awesome. Uh, and then after that, you know, I kind of forgot that I was injured. We said, look, we'll go into a very unspecific training block and we we're hitting like high bar tens and so on. Can I um, just say, can I just say, this is where you requested a five by five. The high bar tens were after Euros. You requested a five by five after Nationals. And we get, we went high bar tens instead. No, we went for a five by five. No, dude, we're hitting high bar tens. Maybe the five by five was after, but yeah, go on. This this is it. That was another moment of maybe a bad choice uh, in the injury valve. <laughs> right? uh, so anyway, we hit these high bar tens. Uh, they're taking some strain off my off my adductor, which was nice. But over the course of the block, it just turned into a you know a, a right leg high bar squat because I couldn't take it on my left leg, and that's where the pain was going. It was my adductor wasn't healing. I just wasn't using it. Um, so then. You know, the adductor just got too bad. We were in lockdown. Uh, I managed to get it to, it, like, have a little setup at my garden. So I was, I was squatting away, but injured. So we took some time, gave the adductor some proper attention, pulled back on squats, and it was starting to get better. I then asked for a five by five. <laughs> All this time, my glute on my right leg, so the opposite leg to the adductor, started getting tighter and tighter. Uh, by tight, I just mean, like... You know, it was kind of stiff, for lack of a better word, right? From on day to day tasks, um, but it wasn't painful. So I continued to lift, and uh, as the adductor progressed, weight started to climb again on squats and deadlifts. But the glute then started to become painful until the glute was in a different form of pain to the adductor, debilitating, and and squatting was very sore. 
uh, and then deadlifts became very sore. So uh, then that was August, and the glute issue ensued, and we spent months trying different things with Ed, uh, with each other. Um, we tried not squatting or deadlifting at all for two weeks. Uh, we tried pulling back in the load. We tried tempo variations with Ed. We tried so many different things, you know, attacking the glute itself, so many glute isolating accessories. Um, and in the end, I don't even know what, what helped. I think um, it had just been seeing improvements. So we said, look, let's let's work together on this and relieved Ed of the stress of handling myself and my training. Um, and it just started to see little improvements week to week. I think we took high bar as it stressed it a little bit less. Training looked like, I think we had a four at seven on high bar squats, no back downs. We had a four at seven on trap bar deadlifts, no back downs. We had some front squats and we had some snatch grip block pulls. I think like a one back down. Uh, all super easy. And I was just adding kilos every week, staying in that pain threshold of like two or three out of 10 pain. Um, and we just noticed every week I could handle more at the same or less pain. Um, and then, you know, that was improving. Uh, I got COVID, took two weeks off training, came back. And uh, over those two weeks, I kind of uh, noticed some things about my squat. Uh, I was, you know, I, I maybe I could have improved my bracing a little bit. So cued something so simple. It was like ribs down, keep my ribs down during the squat uh, and came back and, you know, had five weeks of the best training ever. Are you saying, Andrew, that, that getting COVID was the best thing that ever happened for your training? <laughs> uh, I mean, the data is there. That's, that's not... The data is there. That's true. Uh, I yeah, want to, if, if you don't mind, there's two things that I think are really important that you alluded to there that I wanted to, to dig into a little bit. Yeah. And one is that you were working with Adam through this. And we had alluded to this in the past. And it wasn't, Adam was like, well, fuck, that's, that's shit about your doctor. Sure, let me know when it's better. It's that <laughs> you were able to work together through this. And yeah. I suppose a connected point that I wanted to talk about was you spoke about operating in that tolerable pain threshold. And that if you're training and rehabbing a certain injury or pain experience and you're expecting to do something with no pain, it's potentially a little bit unrealistic. And not help. Oh, it's it's rough when you do expect that, you know. After yeah. periods of time off, and you're like, "Look, I'm going to come back. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go for it." And then it tears you apart when you feel that pain again, and um, expecting some magic to have happened. Mm -hmm. Um, which you know, it's it's okay to hope. It's okay to look for less pain, but I think uh, you're looking for uh, injuries are all different, you know. Uh, and pain is so weird. You guys spoke about that. Um. But over time, you're just looking to to take baby steps uh, with manageable pain, I think. That's that's something you mentioned that we, we were seeing very small improvements. And at the start, those small improvements were tiny. You know, those small improvements were very, very small. But over the course of weeks and months, these small improvements compounded, you know, upon themselves. And all of a sudden, where we where we did see, you know, X amount of improvement in a month, we are now seeing that improvement in a week, week. you know, and then, and then two weeks later, we're, you're, you know, we're, we're feeling like we're back, you know? So it's about kind of, if you are in that injured situation, it's about taking those little wins because I promise you those, mm. those, what seems so significant, insignificant at the time really, really does add up, add up and compound to these really meaningful strides that you'll end up taking towards the end of the, the injury experience there is a a temporal element to the frustration though you kind of find oh god like you know it's been a month and i'm still not better or i've only made x amount of progress on the injury but like i was the same um and it's only through having the injury that i really saw how those small periods of time really don't matter like what we had like nine plus months of dealing with this where i couldn't I couldn't finish two straight blocks of training uh, or two straight weeks of training. And then now I'm stronger than ever. And it was, it was from it, taking these little wins rather than looking for these massive wins in a short period of time. You know? For sure. For sure. Love that. Do, would you say your, 
you're much more grateful with the training process at the minute having been through this this shit time that you can appreciate these small Absolutely. wins as you say that a little bit more and you can appreciate not only the small wins but then compounding as you said adam to build this momentum for you to as you said and are showing us building you up to be the strongest you've ever been it's the same as training i guess it's like injury or not you're looking for these small wins to build up over time yeah. um sure you might hit a lucky combo of low stress outside of training and your body weight goes up or you just you just you're in this good zone and, and one block you might add you know 30 kilos to your squat five rep max or something awesome and it happens it does happen but we can't expect it to happen all the time um and it's it's like you know we all know it we, we see instagram and everybody posts their best lifts we see the strongest lifters because everybody wants to see them so they're on our feed um and it's it's tough to see this and people are hitting these snazzy singles at six so we're like what like i can't take my one at max at six um run your own yeah. race right that's, yeah run your that's, own race that's what it's about the whole thing about social media in general isn't it like you see people out in fucking spain or whatever having the crack and you're like what am i doing <laughs> and you see people posting their prs seemingly every week from time to time as you say and you're like mm. i'm here dicking around with fucking high bar tens <laughs> i think um mm. i think you're at a, a serious disadvantage if you're in that situation and you don't have a coach i think mm. if you have a coach that uh, a coach really is pivotal in keeping you grounded through all of these external stresses of which we have so many now you know um like when we talk about small wins sometimes entire blocks can be dedicated to just just a small win you know and if if you're a lifter and you don't have a coach and you're just kind of following along you know a training plan or whatever your only expectation is that you're going to get stronger you know you're not aware of the nuances and the subtleties that come with that you know like for example certain blocks i'm thinking of a specific individual right now and and their block their current training is structured entirely to just make the weight feel better on their body you know so a win a step towards the adaptation we're trying to make in this block is simply the bar feeling nicer on their back you know i don't care if the if the load is up 10 i don't care if it's down five if the bar is sitting nicer on your back while you're squatting that's that's a one of these steps that we're talking about one of these these um victories that will compound it will compound you know over time and over blocks into that future one rep max that that we're talking about or, or that this insane like kind of block that you're experiencing andrew where everything just seems to seems to be going right mm. something i wanted to talk about um is your switch to sumo <laughs> Switch to the dark side. Yeah, Something I swore I'd never that. do. I'm desperately disappointed. <laughs> desperately disappointed that I'm out pulling you, dude. We'll see I tomorrow. Mean, there's that. There's that. <laughs> we'll see come the end of the year. Out pulling me plus three RPE. <laughs> Oof. On a fake. Hit me where it hurts, huh? The reason I want to talk about it, not just to shit on Connor, <laughs> is um, is because for two reasons a you, you know you swore to yourself that you were a conventional puller you know you, you didn't like sumo but also b we have also had some negative experiences with sumo in the past mm. kind of things that sumo kind of sparked little aches and pains and niggles and things in the past um, aches, pains niggles frustration you know so how's that been how like was there a moment where you kind of were like oh shit maybe maybe there is something to to sumo do you, was there a specific moment where you realized that man you know the moment you know i came in i think i i came in to hit my first deadlifts from the floor in like like we said months months i'd been hitting these beltless tempo block pulls with pain and uh we came to hit after a block of trap bar deadlifts we came to hit conventional deadlifts and you know it felt good it felt all right uh probably like i said i went to that three out of ten pain i think it hit like 160 for five and I said, look, I'm ready to start taking these small wins. That's a small win. Next week will be 165 and we're on the, we're on the road again. Um, but I had just been watching people pull sumo online and I was like, damn, 
oh, I'll just do it. I'll just pull 140 sumo. Maybe it won't hurt. And I was like, oh, that wasn't too bad. I'll put on 160, you know, match the conventional and see what it feels like. Didn't feel too bad. Didn't hurt the way it used to on the knee. So I was like, oh, I'll go 180. You know, I haven't lifted in ages. I pulled it and I was like, and then, you know, 20 kilos all the way up to 240, which like I hadn't pulled in like, a, you know, a year. And um, yeah, there it was. That, there it was, you know. In the same breath, praising, taking the small wins and taking your time. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it just yeah. felt good. I don't know. It worked out, didn't it? It Fucking worked good. out and uh, we're pulling, you know, I don't know. I would imagine now those small wins would have com- compounded to a reasonable conventional deadlift, but we almost jumped that. And I'm lucky to have that, that opportunity. You know, nobody expected, even the physio was surprised that sumo hurt less on the glute than more, you know, beating the, the odds, but, uh, whatever reason, I'm probably just an idiot. I'm like squatting my sumo. I don't know, but, uh, it's working and, uh, it doesn't hurt, which is the main reason we swapped, you know? And then now less pain and more strength, more gains. So yep. nice. It's, it's been something we've been toying with for literally what, four years now. We would, we would trickle it in, take it Some out, trickle it in, take it out. <laughs> yeah. Actually the first time, the first time I, I tried to pull sumo, we ran it for a few weeks into my first competition um, in 20, do you know, 2017, 2018? March 2018, 28, March 2018. 2018, right? And uh, I was like 16, um, I was warming up on sumo and I like did something to my glue. It like, you know, I injured my glue. I don't know what it was. I was too young. I hadn't experienced anything like that. And I had to swap to conventional then to to, to pull at the meet. Um, and I hadn't pulled conventional in ages. Uh, that was my first experience knowing that things can go wrong at a meet and, uh, <laughs> and you can get through it anyway. But, uh, yeah, that was the first, that, that just set us off, you know, first time trying it and my, and my glute like popped or whatever <laughs> shit happened. And we tried it again and again, every time we get a little bit closer, you know, we would, you know, you know, take the slack a little bit better or we'd, you know, be more confident with the bar or whatever. Uh, the, but the pain in my knee kept coming back. Um. So yeah, we tried it so many times, but it just seems to work. <laughs> mm-hmm. Do you think it's important to, like you may, as you say, on, on like an exploration block, try something? Yeah, it may not work out. That doesn't mean it will never work out. You know, as yeah, Adam that's something... always says, it's a dynamic process. If you had said, if you had just written off Sumo entirely over that one experience, who's to say you'd be out pulling me now this week? <laughs> I, that, that's what I mean. I, I don't know if I'd even be pulling comfortably yet, you know? Mm. Um, but it's something that, that's something I never would have considered. I, I would have thought, you know, I'm, I'm not a sumo puller, full stop. Even Adam said those words to me. Adam is, is that, you know, fall tier two. I was in Bantry and uh, we're like, look, we're here now, pull some sumo so I can get you in person. And he was like, no, that's dog shit. I'm not doing that shit. You look ass, your hips don't open right. Your hips aren't built for sumo. And, uh, I was like, yeah, you're so right, man. And um, here we are. I don't know how it came about, but uh, yeah. Is there anything else in your training just on that, that you've like written off entirely? You say, no, fuck that. That doesn't work for me. That you would consider trying again? And Adam, I, I'd like to ask you the same thing. Myself personally? No. I think uh, I think I'm pretty open to whatever we do. Um, I don't think there's anything that shocked me as bad as sumo at the time. Um, no, I think, I think everything I like, Adam has some that he won't give me, but that's, that's him <laughs> to say. Um, double pause squats. That's all. Double pause. Actually, Fair. you don't, you don't like high rep squats right now. For you, for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. To be very clear, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to prescribe you high bar tens again for, for quite a long time. Maybe but, not. Yeah, and maybe not. not a five by five, no matter how. <laughs> <I do it. laughs> There's um, something to that. Ahead, and this is just a super quick, because it's something I've, and I, I think I know where Andy's coming from as well, but, but correct me if I'm wrong. It's that when we go and do one top set and back it down. And then you see people who are able to do like multiple sets of this top weight. You're like, Jesus, I'm an unfit bastard. Like, I, how the fuck do people do this? Like, you know what? I want to maybe build a bit of work capacity and I'll be able to do three sets of this. Like, even when I was warming up today, my last, last warm up, 
I'm like, fuck, I couldn't take a few sets of that. <laughs> am I am I on the same kind of vein there? Yeah, I think I think that might have been why. I think uh a lot of the things that I request in training that Adam wasn't otherwise going to do are inspired by seeing other people do them. Uh and it's I don't think there's too much harm to it, you know. Obviously when you're when you're when you guys have something in sight, like a comp coming up, maybe don't try the the dumbbell presses or the you know, the ten by ten arms you wanna do or whatever it is that you see online. But um the five by five, yeah, I think a lot of people do train like that and you see a lot of that online. Um I think now you see more and more top sets um from various clubs all around the world. More and more people are hitting that kind of RPE'd top set. But uh there's still a lot of like four by six, just prescribed four by six. There you go. And I, I just wanted to try it. Um uh like you said, there's people that just seem to uh just seem to be able to pull no like their five sets as if you know it was one set but like it's just it's just a fitness that you develop you know we're we Absolutely. train top sets we're good at top sets maybe they would suck at top sets maybe they might be great at hitting five sets at six but then when they go to a five at nine it could it, they could find yeah. it very difficult their yeah. mid-range their mid-range strength let's say and their uh, i don't want to say fitness it's a very general term but their capacity to do endurance. all those sets. yeah yeah that, and then maybe their top end strength or their ability to express this maximal strength maybe isn't as good and maybe that's why we've seen the success that we've seen at meets you know like mm-hmm. especially adam seems to just do some fucking harry potter shit when it comes to peaks like he will just pull this this strength out of thin air and they're like fuck it it's working i don't care <laughs> I hate the Harry Potter reference, but thank you. <laughs> You're a wizard, Adam. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, look, keep the goal the goal, you know? Like, I think it's a grass is always greener kind of thing as well. You know, you, you see someone, especially someone who's strong, doing a, doing a five by five or something like that. It uh, It's obviously going to be attractive to try something, especially when you try it yourself and realize like, God, I'm terrible at this, you know? But remember yeah. what we're doing here. You know, if we were doing, if, if the competitions were, you know, sets of five, like if we had to do a five RM a comp, we might be doing something different there, you know, but, mm. but we're not. We're, we're, if this we're, was we're CrossFit keeping... or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, that's, exactly. yeah, it's, you're actually, you're on the money there when you say, like when you, especially when you see somebody who's strong or somebody who's well accomplished and you see them doing something that, that you don't do or that you're not good at, it's too easy to infer he is strong because of this. Yeah. Like he's doing super heavy rows. That's what I got to be doing right there. Why? Why aren't we doing accessories? What's and then you're like, calm down. What you're doing is working. This is the rationale behind it. Shut up. Do your job. <laughs> <laughs> I actually recently fell into that trap myself. With with uh, well, it also happened that front squats were the only like real pain free squat I could do, but. I really wanted to get good at front squats because I saw someone who was better than me at front squats. And I was like, how is that lad better than me at front squats? <laughs> Especially when they're weaker at you than yeah. you in other things. You're like, what the fuck? Exactly. So I did a few weeks of front squats and I, I'm i over front squats. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it definitely would be cool to have a savage front squat. You know, that's, that's one of the things, you know, you rock up to a commercial gym and do a sick front squat. But yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm over it. When you see like Chinese weightlifters online, they weigh like 30 kilos in their front squat and 220. <laughs> like, how do you like it's and they do mind. they do the, the stupid Olympic weightlifting. They lift it off blocks like they'll walk it forward off blocks and then walk it back onto those blocks. It's gas. Yes. Andrew, what are your goals as a junior lifter? What are my goals as a junior lifter? Probably beat Connor Campbell's total. Um, I think you've done wait, that. Wait, wait, hold on. Let me <laughs> let me ask. Let me let me ask something quickly, uh, Andrew. What was your total uh, in fives the week just gone? Just the week just gone. Uh, Six hundred and ten. Yeah, you might have them. You might. You might, <laughs> you might have them. <laughs> I thought it was, it was a little bit to go, but uh, yeah, no, nah, I don't know. As a that. junior. You're well, welcome, Connor. I had to have three fucking compliments. <laughs> <laughs> oh, run your own race, dude. Um, but <laughs> no, you, we can put we can outpull each other at the end of the year, dude. 
that's that's all that's um, fair enough conventional though <laughs> yeah sure um i'll give you that so uh what you call it yeah come the end of the year um man to be honest after the year we've just had i didn't know if this year i'd be as strong as i was last year i didn't know i was probably thinking look let me try and at least chip the total that i hit last year at nationals in 2020 uh, so to have the opportunity to, to hit a bigger total and probably a much bigger total is surreal. So um, numbers wise, I'm not too fussed whether we hit any anything. I'm not too fussed. I know there'll be something fun on the table as the year goes on. Um, if I know Andrew, I think this means I have something in mind. I just don't want yep. to say. <laughs> yep. Over the course of the of the junior career, we know a 300 squat will fall. That's How old I'm are you, saying. Andrew? I keep forgetting. Um, 27. Because <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've had people people DM me, people from DCU and, and people involved in other uh, collegiate clubs. And for those of you who don't know, I, I set up the, the DCU Powerlifting Club and Andrew is in his first year in DCU and he was recently elected as the first year rep. And I had somebody text me, he's like, he's not in first year, is he? <laughs> yes, he is. And they're like, what the fuck? I yeah. think now I think that was a reflection of how strong you are rather than how old you've started looking recently. I, I think it's a lot of things. Actually, I remember at Nationals twenty was it Nationals twenty nineteen? Yeah. When we're we're in the warm up room. Stephen Cusack looks at me and he's like, How the fuck is he seventeen? <laughs> You're just there conducting yourself like a thirty five year old man. It was it was gas. Um for anyone who doesn't know, I'm nineteen. I'm nineteen. I'd forgotten <laughs> for a second. It's easy too. It's easy too. Yeah, so we've got we've got four years as a junior. Um, Fuck, man. Yeah, yeah. we'll we'll do, <laughs> we'll do something fun. I'm sure. Like four years, and I, I don't know. It's scary. Everyone who says this to me, or even when I'm thinking about it myself, we all like look back and it's like, what the? F- why? Why did I dick around so much when I was younger? <laughs> it's like, why did I do this? But that's crazy fucking four more years i guess mm. i guess if we're to talk about goals that aren't number related does anything pop to mind goals that aren't number related damn i hope i, I definitely want to want to represent ireland again uh whenever that opportunity arises um 100 percent. i seen my Irish singlet the other day and i was like holy shit like now that i'm back lifting like it, it feels tangible again before, when I was injured, the only goal was to lift. Um, whereas now that I can lift, the goal is to lift big and definitely to go abroad again. I don't, I don't want to put a time frame on that for obvious reasons with COVID um, and other things, but definitely in the next, in the foreseeable future. Mm-hmm. Um, something I wanted to talk to you about was your college experience so far. I thought you were about to bust out. Someone wanted to talk to you about was that overshoot you hit the other day, right? (laughs) That was a question submitted by me. (laughs) So tell us a little bit about what you're doing in college, how you're finding college as a year, as a first year, you know, given the the circumstances. Circumstances. Um, I'm studying psychology in DCU, uh, the mecca of colleges in in Ireland. And um, yeah, so it's great. I love it. the circumstances, however, do make it weird, you know. Um, I would love, like, I've I've made some good friends in college, and uh, I'd love to be in there, just experiencing college life with them, you know. But um, having to do it all from home, particularly when it gets tough, when it gets busy, there's a lot to do. Uh, it's it's a weird situation to be in, all right. Um, I'm I think I'm lucky, and I am glad. I love the course so much. Um, I love what I'm what I'm learning. So I guess when there is a lot to do, at least I'm up for doing it. But if there is a module that I didn't like, which there has been, it's quite tough when you're at home. You're not you're not in the midst of everybody else doing it. Uh, you're not getting up or you don't have to get up early in the morning to, to go to college. You don't have to do certain things. No one sees you. You know, it's it's tough. It's tough. Um, how how are you finding psychology so far? Have have you have you delved into what you're hoping to delve into? Has it has it kind of met your expectations? Uh, it's definitely met expectations. I, I love it. Um, 
coming into psychology, I just knew I was very interested in behavior in general and uh, behavior across the board, different ages, different people. Um, but coming into psychology, we've touched on everything I could possibly want. You know, um, I don't know what I want to, you know, follow up on in post-grad, but, uh, I'm loving what we're doing at the moment. We're doing, we're touching on everything, anything that could be touched on. And it's just, it's awesome. Have you found it relating back to your training at all yet? Um, you know, there has been definitely, um, I think various things from, you know, there was something that, Oh, it was, uh, we're doing like mental imagery and cognition and, uh, visualizing came up and how in sports psychology is used a lot. And then every night I started visualizing a 300 kilo squat um, and it's helped it, it, you know, it feels good. And uh, you guys spoke about visualization um, and uh, it's something that I definitely do uh, every week. This last block, once I hit a comp squat session every night going to bed, I would imagine the comp, the next comp squat session, knowing and kind of telling myself what I could do, what I was capable of. Um, and that visualization was, was, brought to me just in a in a small bit of cognition you know and um, right down to personality psychology where uh you know we talk about psycho like personality traits theories and you know neuroticism and the likes where uh, you know could be quite applicable to training Um we briefly discussed this the other day i don't know if you want to talk about that now adam but um things like neuroticism and uh different personality traits that definitely weigh into people's training um, as an athlete. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. I think what, what are you referring to the time to peak discussion we were having? Yeah. 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 So I guess I'll give the premise like within our training, within the, the way we structure training, something we're looking for block to block is what we refer to as being your, your time to peak. And, and when I say, say peak, what I mean is, um, I suppose time to peak in adaptation to the stimulus that that we're presenting, which is your your training. Um, the way we look for that that peak is in, I suppose in in both like you know fatigue ratings, the, the actual individual numbers of the lift. Would you guys agree in that the, the the actual numbers, the raw numbers, are what would dictate time to peak in your eyes most? Yeah, up until yeah. this recent discussion, man. Yeah, well. I still think that like, you, you know, the, the, the numbers definitely tell the, the clearest picture. Absolutely. Right. Um, but for example, if someone um, peaked in adaptation uh, in a number sense on week five, but they despised week five and, you know, only weeks one to four were positive in their eyes, there's a, there's a discussion to be had there about what their actual time to peak should be going forward, you know, or what, what number we should take forward in terms of, you know, uh, using it when it matters for, for like competition peaks and things like that. Um, but yeah, the, the, the conversation we were having is what creates time to peak, because I think we've all observed time to peak being this repeatable number, you know, like I've seen, for example, Andrew, I've seen Andrew peak in adaptation to a block of tens in five weeks. And I've seen him peak to a block of fours in five weeks, you know, like we don't know why it, it doesn't, it, there doesn't appear to be a clear reason why, like we, I suppose up until recently, we, we kind of just kind of accepted it as being some, some combination of mostly physiological and some psychological factors. But the discussion we had recently was that, um, I suppose we believe now at this point that time to peak is, is mostly down to the psychology behind training as a whole behind the endeavor that is training, um, specifically the personality traits, um, that, that any individual would have. I think those are what factor mostly into your, your time to peak. And I think that's the reason we see this repeatable number that we can't otherwise explain, you know, when, when someone especially given like we're giving people this structure to work in, you know, we're giving them a framework. Uh, we're explaining how, how it is that, that we run things. We explain time to peak to them. So that they're expecting this um, repeatable number. So when they hear, take myself, for example, I peak or 
I tell myself I peak in th- in three weeks, right? Which is a really short time. And I know Connor, who's who's my coach, has had issues with with that number in the past. Um, Connor knows all about peaking too fast. Fact, fact. Strike one, Andrew. Um, <laughs> Guess who's never coming back on the podcast? <laughs> <laughs> you, because you're so embarrassed. Um, like if I would train past those three weeks, if I would train into week four and week five, I would feel awful terrible you know and uh i couldn't explain that but um yeah I, I think when you start to expect this peak to occur oftentimes this peak does start to occur and it can it can be even more complicated than that when you when you expect if let's say you notice um, a less linear peak trend you you notice like a uh, weeks one and two linear gain week three um fall week four or five linear gain you can start to expect that bad week on week three and almost like we talked about last week manif- manifest it into existence you know so i definitely think time to peak is uh is leaning more towards the psychological than it is the physiological as we as we once thought did i pretty did i pretty much cover yeah what we were talking about? yeah no i think that, that clears up i know you had mentioned the um the specific personality traits andrew if you want to kind of talk about that Oh, here we go. Pop quiz. Okay. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of theories regarding uh, personality traits um, that have been put forward across the years. Um, probably the most widely accepted one is the kind of big five, if anybody's heard of it. Um, what are they? So I remember them with Ocean. Okay. So O is openness to experience. C is conscientiousness. E is extrovertedness, A is agreeableness, N is neuroticism, okay? Um, and I think, Adam, you had mentioned that, like, someone being higher or lower on, say, the neuroticism scale might affect how they then approach training or approach even the idea of the, t- of the time to peak, you know, um, different how they approach sessions and so on, and then that, in turn, affects their time to peak, you know? Mm-hmm. I you, it... Sorry, just for me there, well, I'm catching up on, on the conversation that you had. It, when you say if somebody is neurotic or they're high on this neuroticism scale, let's say, what would you what would you mean by that and how would that manifest itself? So, of course, like there's thousands of, of characteristics that, of people's personalities. Um, and the way these, these traits were decided on was kind of like factor analysis. So they would take so many words, right? So many adjectives and characteristics um, regarding uh, people's personalities and uh, they kind of whittled them down. So, you know, they couldn't just say happy, sad, angry, or these things. You'd have, you'd have a million personality traits that someone could possess. Um, so neuroticism kind of covers a lot of things um, in general. And I think so the, what sticks to me is someone high in neuroticism or if you have like quite a neurotic reaction to things, uh, you might feel anxious. You might feel kind of, kind of high emotion towards things and kind of panicked even. That's not, I don't want to like butcher it, right? But um, generally an anxious reaction could be considered neurotic and kind of jumping to that reaction. Whereas someone low in neuroticism might be pretty calm, might be pretty chill with things. So let's say they have a bad week when it bring it back to powerlifting or a bad session, they might be like, okay, you know, they kind of roll with the punches a little yeah. bit more. Okay. Whereas uh, I, I would consider myself quite neurotic with training, and I react, I react, I'm quite reactive to training emotionally. Um, so I would probably feel, you know, oh god, why is that so painful? Or, oh god, you know, that's down. Or oh my god, that's up. Oh, uh, amazing! I'm going to hit 300 next week. You know, um, quite, quite neurotic. But uh, yeah. Cool. No, no, thank you for that. Yeah. Yeah, that pretty much summarizes the whole conversation. Am I, am I out of focus for you guys? Yes. God, yes. that's very annoying. Anyway, um, so actually... Just shake the toaster that you're recording with. Just <laughs> I wish I wish it was a toaster. Um, okay, so one question that we didn't get around to last week, last podcast, um, was a very broad question. I think it'll be a good one to, to end on. I suppose we can all kind of touch on it or maybe just go down a big tangent, but what annoys, I suppose, Connor, 
and Andrew and I. So I suppose, is there any thing you just want to have a good complaint about right now, Connor? So many things. <laughs> this, this one assignment that's really kicking my ass. <laughs> but um, it, it, I suppose to, to kind of keep it relevant to the discussion that, that we'd had, it's when, and I, I, I was talking to, to, to another trainer about this during the week, uh, shout out to, to Iron Ian, but I had said to him in this Q&A that he was doing that people who try and emulate the greats or try and copy what they're doing it's like if i walk into to platinum when i see andy pulling 232 for a set of five or squatting 227 for a set of five i will try and copy what he's doing right now i it, i suppose it's it's more applicable to let's say bodybuilding or uh let's say a more traditional top-down approach to powerlifting whereas a bodybuilder might need to do a shit ton of volume as his uh minimum effective volume goes goes up and if I'm a young lad and I go in to see this man's doing 10 sets of 10, and I think, well, he's fucking huge. So I got to be doing 10 sets of 10. That is something that annoys me so much because it's so potentially injurious and just so false of an idea. And that we should more so get beginners to focus on what the greats did to get to the position they're in rather than what they're doing now while they're at the top of their game, you know? Um, that's all I'm going to say in it because I could go on and on and on. <laughs> um, I guess I'll, I'll jump in with, with mine next and then Andrew, you can you can close the show up since you're the, the guest of honor. But uh, yeah, something something that has been on my mind, um, something that does bug me is I suppose the trend of never being satisfied with the work that you've done. You took mine. Did I take yours? I was hoping yeah. Connor wasn't going to take mine. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it, it seems to have become trendy to like, you know, to never be satisfied, to always be hungry for more, to, to never be able to stop and smell the roses. When like part of the process, part of what we're, we're doing here is acknowledging the highs, you know, is taking... A, 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 a sample size of your work looking at it and being like damn I did good you know similarly there, there def don't get me wrong there is definitely a, a time to look at a, another sample size of your work and be like damn I could have done better you know let's say you went out on the piss you know three nights a week for seven weeks you know and and it was like an important time in your training where you really wanted to do well and you looked at that in review fair enough you know you could have done better i agree with you but if you if you did li literally everything right you know you approached each session with with the goal of of giving it your best shot and and completing the the, tr the session as it is on on the on the paper and you come out of that training cycle with serious results with prs i hate the trend of being like yeah you know still still lots to improve on uh, could have been better you know messy messy form i don't give a shit about your form you just hit a new one rep max what are you talking about again it kind of ties back into what we were talking or talking about earlier of keeping the goal the goal you know the goal is to get stronger here it's not going to happen overnight it's not going to happen in a year it's not going to happen even in five years you know take the wins you know stop smell the roses because there are going to be worse training blocks you know it it, I, it seems to happen in people with lesser experience most often I find, um, or people who've been surrounded by, I suppose, an environment that promotes that. But in people I've observed it, it occurring in, these people haven't really ever had bad training blocks. They have, haven't ever had that year long injury that they had to grit out and overcome, you know, they've only ever had the positive. So it, it kind of comes easy to them, you know, but I promise you, you're doing a massive disservice to yourself if you're not stopping and giving yourself a pat on the back because you need it. You're human, you know, mm. but yeah, that's, that's me. Absolutely. <laughs> I feel, I feel, I feel much relief right now. <laughs> <laughs> the weight is off my shoulders. <laughs> there is, I, I'm only going to just mention this, but you're, you need to find the dichotomy between being process oriented and goal oriented. And you need to, as you say, be able to stop and smell the roses because if you're, 
just focusing on the process, well, you don't really have any direction. If you're just focusing on the goal, like you say, Adam, you're just going to be fucking pissed off at yourself. Because this goal is always just going to, especially in powerlifting, get further and further away from you. So if you're always like, could have done better there, you won't be in the sport too long. Agreed. Mm. Agreed. All right, Andrew, close us out. What's been pissing you off? Dude, you took my, my, <laughs> my bugger. What's been pissing me off? I'm, 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 ha- I'm too happy recently, guys. He's too uh, happy. That's I'm terrible. in a great place. I'm back training. <laughs> I love everything. Amazing. Amazing. We'll close it out with this then. What advice? Because, you know, uh, you, you, if I was 17 or 18 and I was looking at a fellow like yourself having such success in what is just what is inherently a cool sport you know like you're just the sport is literally just lifting as much weight as possible like when you're 16 17 that's the coolest shit ever you know um what advice would you have to to those who are you know not younger than you maybe not even younger than you but just kind of looking at someone like you and being like god i would love to do that what what advice would you have for for that kind of person well uh i think there's an endless amount right um and i think what you just spoke about was probably one of the most important things of not necessarily stopping to smell the roses but appreciating all of the all of the roses you know all of the good things um it's easy to look forward and look ahead to these goals look ahead to john hack you know with this monster total monster numbers and jamal browner and everything like this um when you're you know when you're squatting half of their bench press and i I know i know the feeling um but appreciate that that will take time and there's so much time in between it's quite related to to your point adam where like powerlifting is a is a a long process and connor mentioned how the goal just keeps getting further and further away you got to appreciate what you're doing in the here and now um you you got to appreciate like that the years running up to those PRs that you're looking for are awesome. The training you're doing is fun. I, I, I would have given my, my other glute to be able to squat 200 kilos again when I, when I couldn't squat, you know, um, I would have given anything. Um, I'd also say just stick to the basics and probably get a coach as in, sorry, stick to the basics. Uh, worry about, don't worry about the micros, worry about the, the macros first get the get the basics right um and probably a coach probably a coach because one of the most underrated things about a coach is the support um having that first pillar of support we're also we're, we're great we have this deadly team um huge number of, of, of members that are there for you they could you could probably text any single one of them and then they'd, they'd help you out but a coach um whether you have a team or not is is that first step to uh, having someone to support you through what is a simple sport, but uh, it can be a complex time navigating uh, your journey through it. So having someone like a coach, even just to talk to about your training um, is, is very beneficial. Awesome. Awesome. You got anything, Connor, you want to throw in? Nope, I'm all good. Very well said, Eddie. He's all good. All right. Awesome. Well, Andrew, we appreciate you coming on to talk about yourself. Yeah. My mom got me this t-shirt, by the way. Hold up. Let's see. It. It's very nice. Whoa, nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Oh, very Andrew. Sick. That is very Andrew. That is very, <laughs> <Yeah>. very Andrew. <laughs> awesome. Wide body. Well, thanks again, Andrew. Uh, again, guys, appreciate um, appreciate you guys watching. My camera's out of focus, so my direct eye contact with the camera is wasted. <laughs> but, um, if you have any questions for us, please drop them below. Again, please consider subscribing. We would love that. We, uh, we will see you guys again in less than seven days. Appreciate it. Take it easy. All the best.